Hey folks, Kiltman here, Kiltman at your services. How are you all? Hope you're all doing very, very well. Now we've got some more bad news, yeah. Another top talent from Tinseltown and beyond has now sadly um, died, passed away. The great German filmmaker Wolfgang Peterson. Wolfgang Peterson. The guy that made Das Boot. You're hearing, well, the title theme to Das Boot, The Boat. And you're gonna hear a bit of a hodgepodge of uh, other music from his movies as well. Sadly, I've, not, I've got music from all of his films, but I've not got them on this system, so just make do. But at the age of 81, he passed away. Now he passed away on Friday, on the 12th of August. It is now the 17th of August. But we only got word of this uh, in the wee small hours. And um, so I, I woke up to that. But I often wake up to people messaging me saying, do you know who's died? <laughs> and, and the weird thing is, um, it's never someone that you know I'm related to. It's not like, do you know who's died? Oh, so much from down the road. It's, ne it's never that. It's always somebody from the movies. Because people know that I do these little obituaries and that, like, and tributes to certain people. And so I woke up to, to that. Wolfgang Peterson's dead. Oh, I was like, oh, Jesus. But the thing about Peterson is that uh, his films are magnificent. They are. Uh, they're grueling, they're harrowing, they are ordeals. Because basically what he's doing each time, you look at the likes of Das Boot, a uh, German U-boat crew, cruising the Atlantic, uh, World War II, going through hell, you know, the sonar blips, depth charges, accidents on board, mechanical failings, having to get the, the boat repaired, and like, but also what he captured was the, the sheer mundanity and boredom of endless weeks of nothing happening, dwindling supplies, and, uh, and people getting into his nerves, and the tense claustrophobia of being in that environment. Second to none, he nailed that. I know they made a condensed version of the actual epic long, how many parts was it in? Because I've only got it in one part now anyway, but they made a movie version out of it, and uh, that lost, jettisoned a, a fair bit, fair chunk of stuff. But Das Boot is an absolute classic, and he will be renowned forevermore for making that movie. But he'd also do things like um, Outbreak with Dustin Hoffman, you know, about a pandemic, you know, sort of pre-imagining what was going to happen with COVID and all of that, like, and possibly uh, monkeypox, because there's monkeys in that movie as well. Uh, the Perfect Storm, oh my God, one of my favourite sort of real life dramas. And he, he, George Clooney, uh, Mark Wahlberg, William Fichtner, um, John C. McGinley aboard the Andrea Gale, the true story of what happened, 1993, uh, when the perfect storm hit. Oh my God, you know, it was three weather fronts hit, collided, caused bedlam. An absolutely magnificent movie, I love it. I've covered it a bit on the channel actually, uh, and I need to probably cover it some more. But that, uh, Das Boot, Outbreak, uh, he did the film Enemy Mine, with Dennis Quaid and Louis Gossett Jr., which was like a kind of um, space age reworking of Robinson Crusoe, also Robin, Robinson Crusoe on Mars, and also the film, I think it was called Jewel in the Sun, where um, an American and a Japanese um, opposed you know, um, heroes of war find themselves cut off on an island and uh, during the Second World War and have to, have to team up to survive. And this was the basis of Enemy Mine. And that was a wonderfully visual movie. Wolfgang Peterson was an incredibly visual storyteller. Uh, but also, Troy. Oh my God, Troy. Now, I've already mentioned some of the people he's worked with. In Das Boot, you'd have um, Jürgen Prochnow, who's an unbelievably good actor. Air Force One, Harrison Ford, and, um, oh God, Gary Oldman. Poseidon, with King Kurt Russell, but we'll come on to Poseidon later. Um, Outbreak, Dustin Hoffman, of course. What else did we have? Uh, Enemy Mind, Dennis Quaid, Louis, Louis Gossett Jr. 
in Line of Fire, Clint Eastwood and John Malkovich. And Air Force One has a vote, that's a bit didn't I? But Troy, look at Troy, Brad Pitt, Eric Banner, Peter O'Toole, um, oh god, Brendan, Brendan Gleeson and uh, Brian Cox and uh, Sean Bean. God, the, the greatest collective of, of, of superstars of that time. All great character actors, all great um, superstars, you know, in their own right. And with many, many movies, you know, in their resume. All bringing their own unique talents to a huge, large-scale ensemble movie, which is epic in scale, epic in scope. And Wolfgang Peterson was one of the masters at marshalling huge amounts of people and technicians and pioneering great sort of on-set on special effects. You know, look at Das Boot, how, how they made that set for the, uh, the U-boat, which, there it is, U-96. And uh, it's up here as well, there it is. Snaking past um, this sort of slimy Lovecraftian demon. Um, but Poseidon, again with Kurt Russell, an updating of the original 70s, the Poseidon Adventure, and then you had Beyond the Poseidon Adventure, which are classics in their own right. The critics mauled Poseidon, his remake, and he freely admitted that it wasn't the best of his movies. Uh, but it's it's great good fun. You've got King Kurt in there, and endless little set-piece scenarios that you've got to overcome. A big luxury ocean liner gets overturned by a huge wave and they're going to go through all these various scrapes and adventures people will die in the process like but the perfect storm was the perfect amalgamation of all this George Clooney Mark Wahlberg as I said before and the true story the, 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 the nightmarish scenario they find themselves in going further out into the sea knowing the storms on the way but they've been leaned on by the, the fishery commission you know uh, which is unbelievable it's michael ironside michael ironside yes he's in there as well unbelievable and uh, they've got to go out they've got to put they've got to bring money back they've got to put food on the table a lot of fish obviously and uh, it's a wonderful uh, movie because it, it pioneered putting that ship on gimbals and in the, the big what californian oceanic pool that they use for movies like this or I think they built it for this movie actually. And absolutely so much water was used. Well uh, you've got to simulate the sea and uh, and fucking big waves. And like the poster image. I had the poster. Before this video, I ran round trying to find uh, Wolfgang Peterson uh, memorabilia posters. Uh, my Troy Director's Cut poster, can't find it. Uh, my Poseidon poster, can't find it. Um, and my Perfect Storm poster, can't find any of them. The spook in this house has been up to its old tricks again. Anyway, uh, but he worked with water so much. Obviously, cutting his teeth with Das Boots, it really, really is incredible, uh, as I say, claustrophobic entertainment. And the, the thing about that movie is that it highlights you know the banality, the day-to-day -day humdrum of it, and the the tensions rising. And the thing is, but you sit there mesmerised. We're playing some of this music now. You sit there completely and utterly entranced by this environment and how people interact. Even when there's just silence there and there's sweat dripping off someone, it works. You're actually there. He's transported you from your seat in the cinema on your armchair, on the settee, lying on the floor, in bed, wherever you are. He's put you on that submarine. He's put you there. There's not that many filmmakers, even you, you know, Spielberg can do it, but not all the time. You know, Kubrick put you in the Overlook Hotel, but, you know, with Paths of Glory, did he actually put you in the trenches there? Well, I would say no. Um, and other, other great celebrity filmmakers don't always achieve what they wanted you want to do but Peterson with all of his movies put you there even in a fantastic fantastical environment of enemy mine and you knew it was going to come on to this never-ending story not one of my favorite movies I'll be honest um, but that's not at Peterson's fault 
it's just it's not a very engrossing story i know i know it's a massive cult classic and it it has got the title song never ending story limal which i absolutely genuinely adore that song and if we can get away with it i'm going to play it as well <laughs> here's the perfect storm now this is the um, the what's it called coast guard rescue james horner and he, he worked with Jerry Goldsmith on Air Force One. Oh my God, Air Force One is a great, the presidents, what, the cinematic presidents don't half go through some, some shit, don't they, you know? And uh, unless you've got Jed Arm Butler there to save you, then your president better be Harrison Ford. Because he, the cat and mouse game on Air Force One, when it gets taken over by terrorists, is great stuff. And again, Peterson could do action, he could do Tense standoffs and suspense. And of course, you could do great big battles as well. Troy. I was getting on to Troy before, then I, I sidelined myself. Uh, but Troy is one of my favourite movies. Uh, it's a, it's OTT. It's, it's, it brings in mythology as well. And it, but it condenses... What I don't like about it is it condenses the, uh, you know, the 10 year war for Troy itself. 10 years. 10 years, folks. And the uh, the entire odyssey that um, Odysseus goes on, uh, but it brings in all of the uh, it, it does bring in elements of the gods, and it does bring in the, the whole myth surrounding Achilles, Brad Pitt's Achilles, fucking hell. Weirdly enough, at the time of this film coming out, uh, Troy, Brad Pitt said this this is my defining moment. Brad Pitt said that about basically a mythological comic book character. Um, he is wonderful in the role and he does bring a lot of emotion but he breaks down from a realisation about he's lost his, his Patroclus you know his, his, his cousin um, and then he's killed and abused the body of Eric Banner's uh, heroic uh, Trojan warrior Hector but Peter O'Toole as the king of Troy uh, Priam disguises himself and inveigles himself into the, um, the Greek camp to, to meet Achilles and to um, break bread with him, basically, and uh, and to you know say about his son, please give my son back, and he he literally breaks uh, Achilles, the stalwart hero that is Achilles. He breaks his heart in that moment, and Achilles realizes, oh God, what have I done? You know, I'm I'm better than this. You know, and of course, your funeral rites, and I'm, I'm so, you're a, you're a better king than the one that leads this army. Great lines. There's some great lines in it. Now, Troy, of course, uh, as you will know, there's two versions. There's the theatrical cut, which is hmm, tepid and very Hollywood. And then you've got the actual director's cut, Wolfgang Peterson's cut, which goes on for a hell of a lot longer and it's infinitely nastier. And it, it's raw, it's bitter, it's, it's seething with genocidal verve and, you know, unbelievable but horribly uh, misbegotten hatred and it, it it's a much more difficult film to to, uh, to watch because of the the barbarity that takes place but that's the one that works and it's a wonderful wonderful movie so I urge you to watch Troy if you haven't seen it already uh, and to watch the uh, the full extended director's cut which is infinitely superior to any theatrical version and again Wolfgang Peterson could marshal enormous amounts of people. Okay, there was CGI in there to extend numbers, but he had hundreds and hundreds of people there charging and battling all the time. Welters of gore and really superbly staged and choreographed action set pieces. And it, it is wonderful. It's, it's breathtaking. Uh, and it does culminate, of course, in a very sort of tragic, romantic sort of uh, climax and finale. But it's, I think it still works. It is terrific to see, uh, you know, how Achilles gets taken down. And it's what his mother basically said, you know, don't go into this battle because you, you want your name to live forever, but this battle will ensure that, but you won't come out of it. It's as simple as that. And it, it's, it's a truly great movie in many, many ways. It's as a spectacle, as a story, as a adaptation of Homer's, um, you know, telling of the story itself it, it, it works wonders and I don't think it gets the recognition it deserves I've covered it on the channel a lot 
but uh, it doesn't get, it, it did well at the time, but uh, people don't ever talk about it, they kind of dismiss it. A lot of the movies that came out in the air, sort of uh, the tailwind of Gladiator, I mean, Gladiator brought back the sword and sandal epics, Ridley Scott, Russell Crowe, and I love Gladiator. Uh, but you've got the likes of, uh, well, what would you have? King Arthur, which I've covered. This is the Clive Owen version. Uh, and I love that movie, it's, it's great. It's cheese ball, but it's great at the same time. I've covered it a lot. Um, Kingdom of Heaven, again, from Ridley Scott. And again, you've got to watch the extended cut. If you watch the theatrical version, it's a broken, ridiculous, crap, crass movie. Watch the full extended cut. It's, it's a brilliant movie. It's absolutely brilliant. Uh, and I say, I say the same with Troy, but Troy came in at that sort of tail end when a lot of movies were getting made, a lot of swords and shields and, you know, daring do on the beaches and sandals and that kind of stuff. Uh, but Troy's one of the best that's out there, beyond any shadow of a doubt. Uh, so what else would he do? Uh, well, as I say, in the line of fire, you know, with uh, Clint Eastwood and John Malkovich. Clint Eastwood is the ageing... Uh, Secret Service guy knows there's a hitman out there trying to take down the president and the cat and mouse game he's playing with John Malkovich and it's it's a wonderfully tense movie now what he doesn't do what Wolfgang Peterson doesn't do with that movie is have massive elaborate set piece you know action skirmishes there's action in it there is you know a, a few set twos and you know suspense filled moments when uh, the killer's on the loose, and it, there's a couple of chases in it, obviously. But it, it rings all that back in, and it kind of brings back the sort of the tense internal battles and claustrophobia that was clearly in evidence in Das Boot, which is wonderful. Uh, Outbreak. Now, the weird thing about Outbreak is, I remember loving this. Now, you know, I haven't seen the film since it first came out, but I remember thinking, Jesus, there's a lot, there's a lot going on in this movie. Loads of helicopter stuff, loads of action, there's loads of you know tense situations that our characters find themselves in, and a race against time. I remember being really excited by it. I think this is really this is a much better film than I anticipated. And um, I'll have to get it again. I really have I don't think I've even got a copy of it, which is bizarre. You know, I might do, I might have. I've got most films, you know, ever made. But uh, it's finding them, that's the thing. Now, I've got a feeling I haven't actually got a copy of, of Outbreak, but I will rectify that, though. Now, as I say, Peterson would do historical, wartime, action, adventure, sci-fi, fantasy. He pretty much applied his hand to anything, any genre out there. Not never-ending story. As I said before, I'm not the biggest fan of it. I just don't think the story holds together. It got a sequel out of it, and it did get a great song. Uh, and visually, it's splendid. So again, he could command, as I said before, such a visual storyteller. He was wonderful at evoking um, times, periods, eras, uh, situations, the confines of a, a U-boat, a fantastical world of mud and trees and flying dragons with big, sad, doggy eyes. And... Um, and obviously battles on you know uh, mythological beaches, huge large-scale dramas, and putting it on board again the claustrophobic confines of a, fish, a, a fishing vessel going out into the perfect storm. And you know that that film, that's an amazing film. I know now when you watch it, there's a, there's a fair bit of quite obvious CG in it, but you know a lot of the practical effects that were used, you've got the they've got. The, the Andrea Gale, the fishing vessel that they, they were on, and they're climbing all over, the, you know, the masts and all over the air, the cabin, and all, all up on top of, around and underneath and inside that that vessel. Despite, you know, and, and, and the whole thing's on a gimbal, being rocked back and forth, simulating these huge, tumultuous waves which are buffeting it from all sides, and it's genuinely exciting. And it's genuinely tragic as well, uh, but love it. It's a tremendous uh, evocation of a, a true life event. But, you know, just going through the list again, Troy is incredible. Um, as I say, Das Boot is the one that he will be forever remembered for, 
forever. It's just an incredible movie. And in fact, that's what I'm going to watch. I haven't seen uh, Das Boot for quite some time, actually. I know it very well, but it's you've got to sit and watch it to soak yourself in that environment. To really put yourself there. And this, you, you'll be sweating, you'll be tense, you'll be white knuckling as well. But even, as I say, the downtime, the endless downtime, the sense of humour, the, the gallows humour that runs through it as well, and the finale, you know, which is just incredible. Uh, it blows you away, and literally, it, it blows you away. <laughs> Here's some more of uh, James Horner's score for The Perfect Storm. So he worked with James Horner a couple of times, so on, uh, obviously on this, Perfect Storm, and on Troy as well. But Troy, uh, originally a different score by uh, Gabriel Yared, uh, which was thrown out, uh, rejected. Uh, I think because the film itself changed, not because they didn't like the score itself. I think it was purely because the, the film itself was going through different cuts. This all happens a lot, it happens a hell of a lot. And it's, it's deeply unfortunate. And one of the main uh, composers that always seemed to suffer this would be Jerry Goldsmith. And he'd work with Jerry Goldsmith, of course, on Air Force One, which is a fabulous score. But have I got it on the system? No, I haven't. I haven't. So Wolfgang, I do apologise for that. But it is a great score and a great movie as well. And, you know, at, at the same time as uh, Air Force One came out, you had, what was the other one? With Kurt Russell, Executive Decision. Some people fell into that camp. Oh, I prefer that one. Uh, and then some people were like, oh no, no, I, I prefer Air Force One. And it was all like, aboard a plane, disaster, terrorists. Air Force One, I think, is the better one. It's got more of a, I don't know, it's more exciting. You know. Cheers, y'all. Listen to this sense of dread. This is the Andrea Gale going out to the Flemish cap which is an area of sea where they know they could get some, some good fishing done there, get quite a good haul, but they're going out into basically Hell's Kitchen out there. And it's just wonderful stuff. Let's get a bit of a... Troy. This is a, the main sort of Almost like D-Day landing that the other uh, Greeks uh, do onto the, the, the beaches of Troy, and there's the air uh, being gong being sounded like uh, basically so much as saying like yeah the shit approaching, better get yourselves ready. Now, Peterson, as I say, uh, to be able to command and direct such a huge number of people that's old school filmmaking that's people that were doing movies way back in the 30s 40s and 50s especially the 50s and 60s when you had casts of thousands up because you couldn't augment with cgi and they're all charging against each other and they're battling and you've got to keep the cameras rolling uh, nowadays the likes of peter jackson and um, his lord of the rings movies kind of said like well basically you don't need to have thousands and thousands of people because we can just mimic it we can just do all this it looks great cgi is a great tool when used correctly uh, and, and when it works when it works it's brilliant i don't have an issue with it it's when it doesn't work and it's too obvious and it takes you out the movie that's when it fails but peterson used cgi very wisely uh, in most of his if he had to use it then he'd use it but very wisely but even with Troy, he would bring in a cast of thousands of people who were battling there all the time. And it looks, and you can tell, you can see it. You know, the hundreds and hundreds of people going against each other. And it's just wonderful, wonderfully evocative. Very bloodthirsty, um, very exciting. And the clever thing as well that he does with that is that it would be very easy to side with, um, say, Achilles. Because that's Brad Pitt. And he's Achilles, he's the hero. But you totally sympathise with the Trojans. You know, I'm like, it's not their fault what happened. It's that fucking dickhead from uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, Orlando Bloom, you know, and, uh, and Lord of the Rings. You know, it, it's him, it's his bloody fault. You know, copping off. He's a lover, not a fighter, isn't he? You know, that's quite, that's made abundantly clear in the movie. And he's the one that 
ironically takes out Achilles. But it's it's wonderfully um, adapted from you know the Odyssey and uh, all the tellings passed down through the centuries. But as I say, you, you understand both sides. You know who you hate, and it's Agamemnon, you know, which is Brian Cox. You know, when this is over, they'll, they'll carve the name of Agamemnon in the stone. Your name is written in the sand, be washed away. His constant sparring with Achilles, it's brilliant. And it, Brad Pitt's amazing in those sequences. It's just like, you know, his insults, his snidey comments to what's meant to be his king. You know, you're no king of mine. I don't, I don't follow a king, I don't follow you. I'm here for glory, yes, when I make your name last forever, yeah. But you've got like scenery chewing Brendan Gleeson as well in there. He was in Braveheart, again. Braveheart was a film back in the early 90s, that, or mid, was it mid 90s now, that sort of spearheaded what could have been an, another, you know, epic old school historical action movies. And you will get you will get a few. You, you get Rob Roy, which is actually, uh, to be really honest, Rob Roy's a, a, a better told story, uh, a better adaptation of what really happened than what Braveheart is. I love Braveheart. Don't get me wrong, Braveheart, William Wallace, Mel Gibson, fantastic. But you get Brendan Gleeson would be in there, and Brian Cox would be in Rob Roy, and the two of them would meet in Troy. <laughs> They're time travellers. Listen to this. I think um, Wolfgang Peterson did a few movies before this, but they, I think they were all German films. I don't know them. I, I don't know them. But coming back onto Das Boot, the really clever thing about that, and it, it's obviously it would take a German director to do it, it humanised, this back in 1981, 82, when we got to see Das Boot, um, you've got to remember that at that time, the Germans in movies were still pretty much uh, the villains of the piece. Okay, you had the likes of um, Sam Peckinpah's Cross of Iron, where you're, you're on the side of the Germans going against the Russians, and then the Germans going against their own bloody people because they've been set up and betrayed. Uh, you'd have, what else would you have? Uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, uh, obviously told from a German perspective. And it's a wonderful movie, but, but also, you know, ironically portrayed by Americans, you know. Um, but a wonderful movie. There's the silent version, then you've got the uh, the, the remake. Uh, both brilliant movies. Um, what else would you have, though, where the Germans came across as sympathetic before Das Boot? Perhaps you could say um, A Bridge Too Far, which my dad was in, almost, almost in. Literally, almost in. He was actually out of the frame, but that's a that's a saga. I'm not. I don't want to dredge that up again. Um, but big kilt papa, big Fred Mac. Cheers. You are the hero I strive to be, and I'll never do it. I'll never. I'll never reach that that level. But, uh, but Bridge Too Far did, although we're on the side of the Allies, obviously, um, and the whole Arnhem campaign, Operation Market Garden, you still, you still understand the Germans as well. You still feel for them. Of course you do. They're all in a conflict together. There's no evil. The overriding Nazi uh, regime was evil, of course. But the, the Wehrmacht uh, German army, yeah. And even the guys, the SS and the, the, the Panzers that are in there, the Panzer crews, they're just doing their job. And, and, and they are shown to be human. But it did take Das Boot to completely make people of the Allied countries, the NATO countries, um, suddenly see things from a German perspective. And because you're with that crew, you're on board that sub. And when, you know, the, um, the hunter killers are out after the... Um, the wolf pack and all that, then you feel for them because you're you're on there you're on that sh on that boat, not ship. Sorry, let's get that right. It's a boat, not a ship. You're on board that boat, and you're getting depth charges and you're getting attacked, and you're with them, 
you want to survive. And when they get a victory over the Allies, which is so bizarre, you're cheering. <laughs> Where's that come from? Wolfgang Peterson puts you in that environment, puts you in their boots, and like you're fighting alongside them. So it doesn't really matter. It, it, storytelling um, shouldn't matter. There's, there's no politics, there's no morals, there's no right or wrong uh, with storytelling. If storytelling is done correctly, you can you can view things from the, the completely evil uh, and the, the other side of the tracks and sympathise and understand. That's clever, that's genius, that's how it should work. And Peterson could do that, you know. Again, Troy is a huge example of that, where you're seeing things from both points of view, and you're totally invested in both sides. You may have, oh, I, Eric Bann is my man, you know. No, it, was all, it was always Achilles. Achilles is the one, but Banner puts up a hell of a fight there, you know. One of the, one of the, the best choreographed uh, and long fight sequences between two combatants, uh, two actors that are trained incessantly, relentlessly, to do it and and Peterson's direction. It's fantastic, that duel. And it's terribly sad as well. Uh, but you understand why um, Achilles is so friggin' nasty and condescending and gnarly with with, with uh, Hector. And Hector's saying, like, oh, I, I thought I was fighting you. He wore your armor, he looked like you, you know. And what, what does um, Achilles say? He's killed Patroclus. And it's the rage of killing his own his, his cousin that has consumed Achilles. And Achilles just says, like, uh, what was it? You know, by the end of the day, you'll you'll have no ears, you'll have no eyes, you'll have no tongue. And when you uh, when you're in the underworld, all the dead will know that here's the fool that thought he killed Achilles. You know, it's just, and he basically does that too as well. <laughs> and then Peter O'Toole, and Peter O'Toole at this stage. To get that performance out of Peter O'Toole, who is hamming it up, he is hamming it up, but there is an earnest, old school theatricality to his performance, which actually works in the movie. And it's like Peterson understood, look, we've got you in, you're a big star name, and you're at the right age now to be playing King uh, Priam. And you can bring that pathos and the over overblown theatricality because you're the king of an empire and you believe in superstition and then, and then when you lose your heroic son you're going to make that sacrificial um, descent into the, the enemy camp but you're going to win the day with that having said that he doesn't win the day because he gets to get killed when the Trojan horse goes through which is a, again another brilliant uh, sequence so marvellously executed by uh, Wolfgang Peterson so he died at the age of 81, pancreatic cancer. He died a few days ago. He died in the arms of his wife as well. Uh, that's been quoted there. PR people have said you know, he died in the arms of his wife, uh, Maria. And uh, that's beautiful, isn't it, really? You know? But a wonderful talent. And I'd say it's weird that there's not that many films that we all talk about. You know, let's just go through it again. Das Boot, Never Ending Story, Enemy Mine, In the Line of Fire, Outbreak, Air Force One, The Perfect Storm, Troy, Poseidon. You really would think there'd be more in that that resume. But that's it. That, that's what we've got. I mean, the German films, the earlier movies, yeah. And there's TV stuff as well. But I really, I don't know. I don't know any of that. Um, but he's made an indelible mark on cinema. You know, Das Boot, I said, keep on coming back to it as we always will come back to Das Boot. It's one of the, the greatest uh, wartime stories, one of the greatest tellings of men, men in conflict and how they, how they deal with it. You know, the heightened realism, the, uh, the suspense, it, it's skin prickling. You sweat watching it. You also get cold watching it as well. I don't know, anyone. It, the frozen Atlantic, you know, ice cold waters, and the tense atmosphere of being aboard a vessel where it's combustible. The whole thing could go up at any time. Not, but not only that, you know, even the crewmen could go up at any time. 
but there is that Germanic sense of humour as well. I said the Germans have got a sense of humour. They fucking well have. Look at them pissing all over the air of the officers' cars. I know. They're big. They're doing the, a penile piss rife salute, and it's just when it comes down to it, uh, men in in an army, a navy, uh, or whatever contingent, platoon, battalion, you know, that there's camaraderie. You know, there's a unif unified solidarity between men like that, and uh, so they will do things like this, and you know. It, it's brilliantly um, evoked. Cheers, y'all. And although I'm not the biggest fan of this movie, we are going to have to end on a never-ending story. <laughs> Limal from Kajagoogoo. Weirdly, back in the 80s, what was it, 84 this come out? Was it? I was a massive fan of this song. My mates were all into like rock, and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of my mates were mods as well. Like so, you had endless retreads of the Jam and the Who and all that. But you had Style Council. But I was into a uh, New Romantics, big time. Duran Duran, Nick Kershaw. Oh my God, Ultravox. I love Big Country as well. You all know that. I love Big Country. But I fucking love this song as well. <clears throat> oh dear. Watch how this video gets blocked because of this. Well, I say watch, but if it gets blocked, you won't be watching it. I mean, there's some good visuals in Neverending Story, but the, the, the story itself is so slight. It was a never-ending story. There's not a great deal to that story, is there? It got a sequel, didn't it, as well? I'm not sure if I ever saw the sequel. I remember reviewing this movie uh, for AV Forums, oh God, donkeys years ago. And I wrote probably about 15,000 words on it as well. What the hell? What, what did I find to talk about? It was probably just... I'd start on, on, on the, the, the first paragraph, would bleed into the second, the third, and then repeat itself, because it'd be a never-ending review! Sun's just come out. After all the heat wave we've had, which I've been describing, uh, it, it went all clammy and... Dull the last couple of days, the sun has just come out. Wolfgang, rest in peace. I love this song. <laughs> I'm not sure who the girl is that is singing it with him. I say it's Lamar. Wolfgang Peterson enjoyed making this movie. He was branching out. Why did he get this gig? Why did he go from like Das Boot to this? Or was he just like I'm gonna I'm gonna claim every genre I can? That said, did he, do, he didn't do a western, did he? Didn't do a western. I suppose you could say, in many ways, Enemy Mine and um, Air Force One and Troy. I suppose. Uh, are westerns in their particular thematic sort of style and then adventures that take place and the characterization but yeah we're gonna we're gonna bow out on dash boots klaus doldinger I did a video on this uh, score uh, and on Fast Boot uh, many moons ago, and I wore some uh, well, the best sort of 
attempt I could make of being a U-boat commander. With the air, uh, the peak cap on, and a naval tunic on. <laughs> and a pair of Rocky Balboa shorts, if I remember rightly. You'd have to watch the video to work out why that, why that was going on. Isn't that glorious, that? Then you, you get to the main title theme. We're going to go through it, folks. You may as well, if you're still here. Because look, it was the, that week was groundbreaking as well because it had like a very sort of electronic soundtrack. So it, it wasn't the norm at the time. But German stuff, you know, Germans and electronic music, trio, you know, da da da, uh, Kraftwerk, of course, many, many bands. That is gorgeous, that. It's the way it sort of just, just hits that. It's just gorgeous. And I mean, it simulates the, uh, the sonar as well. It's just, yeah. So clever. This could be reworked into a much faster version, which is my favourite track from this score. It's just that boing when it buzzes. It's almost like you're, you're on board, you know, the sub, the U boat, and like someone clangs a, a spanner down the front of it, and it just reverberates all the way down, you know. Really clever. Doldingham is amazing. It's just so achingly gorgeous. Time's getting on, folks. I'm now about to go to a, a music museum, uh, an exhibition, I should say, of, uh, and we're going to see an exhibition about Scottish bands and lots of memorabilia there, and the stuff from Big Country, apparently. The stuff from my hero, Stuart Adamson, Big Country's front man tragically gone as well. Right, I'm going on to my favourite track from um, Doldinger's score for Das Boot. This is the fast version of that, where you just heard. wonderful it's, it, 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 it's you know the success and they're speeding through the seas this actually evokes the high seas and the you know set the age of sail and like the wind but they're underwater you know but this is optimistic, it's success. You've had a victory, or you're on the hunt. It 
rises. Instead of like boom, it's it's going up. Yeah. Up periscope. Born 1941, Wolfgang Peterson. And no one got the the nuts and bolts, the gritty sweat and blood and tears of just the daily routine. It's something like this, you know. Most filmmakers would have balked at the idea. What well, I'm just going to do a movie set on a submarine. Well, what can I do with that? You're stuck. Where can I put the cameras? How can I have any action? What, what, what kind of drama can I tell? We've got Peter's nailed it. Isn't it just brilliant? So, rest in peace, Wolfgang Peterson. Uh, the world is now sadly bereft of one a great filmmaking talent. Such a shame. You didn't do an incredible amount of stuff, but everything that you did was fantastic in many different ways. So, you know, not every filmmaker can do that. And you work with some of the biggest stars imaginable. You know, there'd be other filmmakers who'd kill to work with the people you work with. Brilliant stuff. Wolfgang Peterson, rest in peace. Folks, I have been always Shelby Kiltman. Um, I'm going to catch you all on the flip side of this. And the sun is really coming out again. And the temperature is rising. Feel it. Please keep it Celtic, keep it Celtic, and I'm going to see you all later. And watch out for that, those blip, blip, blips, because that means something bad's dropping something from above.